Hi everyone, it's Tarrant. And Stella here from Maple University. Thanks for joining us. Today we'll be teaching you how to play Curse of the Wymer Stones. You'll be ready to play the game after watching this video. Stay tuned. Let's learn to play Curse of the Wymer Stones. Game by Robert and Fallon Hay, published by Nuke Cards. If our video has been helpful to you, then please help us to make more by liking the video, subscribing and commenting below. Now let's get to the table. Curse of the Wymer Stones is a one versus many quest. The main players will play as heroes, searching through the dungeons and trying to find the Wymer Stones. Ancient sources of power which will give the heroes the ability to defeat the Cursed Dwarves. Opposed to the heroes will be one villain player. A player who can move the dwarves and attempt to fight the heroes and disrupting their plans by dropping more locks and traps around the castle. If the heroes can find all of their Wymer stones and defeat all of the cursed dwarves in battle, then they'll win the game. But if the villain can turn all players into wraiths before this happens, then the villain is victorious. To set up, each player chooses one of the four heroes and takes its tile and two standees, one living in colour and one wraith in translucent green. Place the living standee on its matching coloured starting space. Find all of the question mark tiles and flip them face up. From them, take the coloured Wymer stones matching each of the heroes that is in play, returning any heroes that aren't in play to the box and then take a number of traps and relics according to the difficulty of your game. For easy setup, you'll want 20 traps and 10 relics. Flip all of the chosen tiles face down, shuffle them up, and randomly scatter them into different spaces around the board. The tiles you didn't place are also shuffled face down and kept to the side for now. Find all the lock tiles and then the villain player gets to place six of them onto the board. They must be placed in locations such that players can't walk around them. For example, this would not be allowable, but this would be. And it's to the villain's benefit to block paths in this way. Find and shuffle the wraith cards, trap cards and relic cards into face down decks. The villain should take the four cursed dwarf cards face up. Choose a first player and you're now ready to play. Curse of the Wymer Stones is played in rounds and each round is played in turns, starting from the first player and going clockwise around the table with the villain always playing last. A player's turn is resolved as follows. First roll one die to see if you gain your bonus ability this round. If you roll one of the three darkened colours then you get nothing. But if you roll a light colour, then you get to resolve the effect on that space. If your tile states can only be used for yourself, then you must use the effect immediately. If it says can be used on yourself or others, then you can use it at any time between now and the start of your next turn. Then you can move, or you can attack, or you can do both in either order. But you can only do each once. When you move, you move up to the number of steps shown in the top corner of your tile. Each step lets you move one space orthogonally around the board. You cannot move diagonally. These purple glows are portals and for one step you can move through one and exit from a portal anywhere else on the board. You can move through another player's character as long as you don't finish your move on them, but you can't move through walls, chasms, locks, or, once they're on the board, cursed dwarves. A major part of the hero's game is trying to uncover these question mark tiles to find their colour of Wymer stone. After you've completely finished your movement, flip over any tiles that you passed by or landed on and resolve them in sequence. If you reveal a sword, then you've found a relic. Remove the tile from the game and draw and take the top card from the relic deck, adding it to your character's supply. You can hold a maximum of two relics at a time, and if ever you were to draw a third, you would have to discard one you were holding. 
All relics are good, and you can discard one to use its once-off special ability at any point in the game. If you encounter a trap, then you must resolve a trap card. Flip the top trap card and then do a die roll against the villain. The hero rolls the white die and the villain rolls red. If the hero rolls higher, then the hero dodges the trap and you'll read the good side of the card and take any bonus printed there. If the scores are equal, or if the villain wins, then you suffer the bad consequences of the trap. In most cases, this will involve removing the trap token from the board and placing it on your tile to represent a point of damage. If all of your damage slots are overfilled, then you're instantly turned into a wraith. There are some traps with a lesser negative consequence, but there are also some which are much worse, often turning you into a wraith immediately. Each hero does have the ability to add one to their die roll against traps of the matching colour. So here, if the ranger encountered a trap with a green icon in the top left corner, then you would get to add one to that die roll. You can also spend a relic after the die rolls to add a value to your die roll. The relic will say add in an attack, and in this case, treat it as if you're attacking the trap. As you move around the board, if you encounter another player's Wyma stone, simply flip it face up. If you encounter your own Wyma stone, then pick up the stone, and this triggers a Cursed Dwarf event. First, place the Wyma stone on your player board. You now have the ability to attack Cursed Dwarves. Then the villain player chooses any one of the Cursed Dwarves, it doesn't have to match the character, plays it face up, finds its standee, and places it on the start space of the player who found the Wyma Stone. The villain will now be able to move this dwarf and use it to attack the heroes on subsequent turns. Either before or after your move, but not both, you may make an attack. And when you attack, you can attack any number of locks or cursed dwarves that are within one space of you, either orthogonally or diagonally. However, you can only attack a dwarf if you have found your Wyma Stone. So, right now, green could attack all three of these. You resolve an attack the same way that you resolve a trap. The hero rolls the white die, and the villain rolls the red one. Then apply any modifiers for relics, and then determine the winner. If the hero has the higher number, then the hero wins. If it's a tie, or the hero has lower, then the villain wins. If you defeat a lock, then you remove it from the board. If you're defeated by a lock, nothing happens. If you defeat the dwarf, you do one damage to the dwarf. And if the dwarf defeats the hero, the hero suffers the damage. To mark the damage, take a trap token from the ones that have been removed from the board, and place it onto the space on either the card or tile. A dwarf which runs out of hit points is eliminated. Flip the dwarf's card over to read its ultimate fate. As before, when you run out of health, you become a wraith. If you become a wraith but still have tiles that you flipped up but not resolved, they simply remain face up for another player to encounter later. When you become a wraith, discard all of your relics and damage tokens. If you have a Wyma stone, you keep it. When you're a wraith, your turn is resolved a bit differently. Firstly, instead of rolling for a bonus, you flip the top Wraith card, and roll to see whether you resolve the top or bottom effect. Then you can move up to two spaces instead of your usual distance. Once you become a Wraith, your primary aim is to get back to your starting space to be revived. You can still use portals as normal, but you also have the benefit that you can walk through walls or glide over chasms. If you walk through a wall, each space of the wall counts towards your movement, such as 1, 2. While if you move across a chasm, you can go the entire distance for a single step in a straight line. Once all the heroes have taken a turn, it's time for the villain to take a turn. First, the villain places two new face-down question mark tiles onto the board, wherever the villain wishes. Then the villain adds one new lock to the board, and as in setup, must completely block off a corridor with that lock. Then if there are any cursed dwarfs on the board, 
then the villain may take actions with each of those dwarves. A dwarf turn is quite similar to a hero turn. It can move up to the number of spaces shown on the card, and it can attack either before or after its move, but not both. Dwarf movement is like wraith movement. They can move across walls or across chasms, and they ignore traps and locks. They're also capable of moving through portals. Attacks by dwarves on heroes are resolved the same way as attacks by heroes on dwarves. Both sides roll a die, and then whichever side loses the conflict loses one health, as marked with a spare trap tile. However, there is an exception. If a dwarf attacks a hero that has not yet found its Wymer stone, then that hero cannot damage that dwarf, even if the die roll goes against the dwarf. Dwarves can also attempt to attack wraiths. Again, you'll resolve with a roll of the dice, and if the dwarf is successful, then the wraith is removed from the board. On future turns, this player still draws and resolves a wraith card, but doesn't roll the die, instead always taking the bad effect, which is printed at the bottom of the card. Because the player is no longer on the board, they can no longer be revived by going back to their home location and instead can only be revived by another player using a relic which allows it to happen. The hero should avoid letting it get to this point. The dwarf does not suffer damage if the wraith wins the combat, even if the wraith has a Wymer stone. Once all players have collected their Wymer stones, and all of the corresponding dwarves have been defeated, then the heroes win. Read the happy ending for your tale on the You Are Victorious tile. If all heroes are ever simultaneously turned into wraiths, whether they're on the board or not, then the heroes are defeated, and read the You Are Defeated card. Curse of the Wymer Stones is designed to be played as a one versus many encounter, but if nobody wants to be the bad guy, you can play cooperatively. There are three rule changes. Firstly, when a cursed dwarf comes into play, then it is placed on its starting space, but never moves. It will be stationary. This makes fighting the dwarves a lot easier, because they're not going to chase you down, especially if you're a wraith. Secondly, because there's no villain turn, no new tiles get added to the board as the game goes on. To offset this, you start the game with every lock tile on the board, instead of just six. And you should play at one of the higher difficulty levels in the rulebook, the easy mode will be too easy. Finally, since there's no villain to roll the villain die, whoever is sitting to the left of the active player is the one who rolls for the villain. And that's how to play Curse of the Wymer Stones. We do hope you enjoyed the video, and check out the project page for the game, we'll put a link to that in the description below. If you find this video useful, please help us by hitting the like button, subscribe to us, and you can also hit the meeple in the corner to do so and hit the bell icon so you'll know when we have new videos. You can also follow me on Instagram for my board games journey. Comments, suggestions and feedback are all welcome in the comments section below. Thanks for watching and see you next time!